Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. If you can do us a favor uh, and everyone shift towards that wall if there's an open seat. Uh, We've got a long line still trying to come in. And so if there's any open seats at all, if you can shift that way. Um, And then just if you're saving seats for someone, uh, I love you. It is 1050, uh, which is 20 minutes past when the service starts. And so I get it. I mean, there's coffee to be had. There there are issues that can come up. A kid's shoe can get lost at any moment and put you behind 20 minutes. But we need you to give up seats for people who aren't here, for the people that are here. Uh, And so if you can make that shift, uh, that would help us make sure that people can get in. Let me welcome back um, our South Lake campus and our Fort Worth campus. They've been off stream for months and months and months as they prepare to roll off themselves to be autonomous churches, but they're joining us here this first week of Advent. And as you can tell, uh, man, I think uh, the production team outdid themselves here in Flower Mound, just did an incredible, incredible job. So now with that said, what I wanna do is not start Advent this week, but start it next week. So the church calendar is a wonderful tool given to us by God to shape and orient the hearts of God's people uh, to, to the rhythms of grace that he would have us live in. But, but today uh, in the life of our family of faith is, is significant for multiple reasons. And so it, it was 10 years ago today uh, that we moved into this building uh, after being jammed up in six services in the red brick building and turning away, much like we're doing this morning, right? Turning away from services and trying to find a way to make this work in a very real way. We were known as the Turnaway Church, and God help us, we're doing it again now. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we found out this Albertsons was going to open up, and so, man, we laid before you. Hey, you know it, we know it, we got to do it. And so we, we started our first giving campaign called We Need $4 Million in the Next 60 Days. Uh, and you crushed it. it like you raised them. And we, had to, we could not afford this, right? So you gave. You gave sacrificially. Uh, I mean, I knew a couple of people that sold a car. And I don't like, who has just a car laying around? And, and, it, and, and you gave. And then we moved in. And we we're like, oh, no, we got to retrofit the building now. And that was $10 million, And so uh, then we had to raise more money. And we did it. And then th- this 10 years ago today was our first morning in this building. It was our first morning to stream to our campuses, not South Lake and not Fort Worth because y'all didn't exist yet. And, and so, but we were streaming live to our campuses and, and I missed all of it. Uh, on Thanksgiving morning, um, 10 years ago, uh, I woke up to the sound of Lauren already preparing in the kitchen. Um, to uh, take food over to my in-laws' house to celebrate uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, I got up uh, and asked her how I could help, and she asked me to give Nora her bottle. Nora was six months at the time. Uh, So grabbed Nora, gave her her bottle, uh, burped her, which was a very dangerous thing uh, with our youngest. The other, not so much, but Nora could at any moment um, wet the room. And um, got her in her Johnny Jump Up, uh, which, you know what that is? Like it's the little spring contraption of joy in the doorway. And, and, and she jumped up and down. And then I, uh, Reed and Audrey were on the couch watching SpongeBob SquarePants. And you can email me about that if you'd like. But he's a, he's a crazy optimist. And, and that's what I loved about SpongeBob. And, um, and then I, I didn't get to my chair um, and really have no recollection of what happened, woke up in the hospital uh, an hour or two later, had a grand mal seizure uh, in front of Audrey and Reed and woke up after they had done the CT scan uh, and and they just informed me that they found a shadow in my right frontal lobe and they wanted to to do an MRI. And so uh, put me in the MRI machine um, and then, man, I'll just never forget the doctor here at Louisville just scooted up his little stool as close to my um, as close to my bed as, 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 he, as he could get. And he just said, hey, um, there's a mass in your right frontal lobe uh, and you're gonna need to reach out to a neurosurgeon. Um, and so, listen, at, at that point, I, 
I don't even know that that landed on me in any kind of way. I just wanted out of the hospital, right? The whole family had been waiting around all day. I'd bit through my tongue when I had the seizure. I was in a lot of, and I just wanted out of there. Uh, And so I don't know if you've ever tried to get released from a hospital. Um, And if you work in hospital administration, God bless you, you can do better. And, um, And right, like if... If the reformer said that, like, uh, always be reforming, uh, we should work on that, right? And so, I, I don't know, I think they had to call the president of the United States or something, get him to sign up. And so finally got released. And, and I'm, man, I, I'm an optimist. I, I just thought, okay, great, I'm going to go see this neurosurgeon. He's going to put me on some meds, and we'll just watch this thing. And literally, that, that was just kind of what was in my head. Um, and so we, we found there were two doctors in uh, the Dallas area that had um, a lot of reps in taking out brain tumors. Because can we just agree, you don't want the rookie on that one. Uh, you probably don't want the rookie on any surgery, but if you're, if you're messing with the brain, you don't want the guy that's two surgeries in. Uh, I, I want the guy um, that, that's 1,000, maybe 10,000 surgeries in. And so we found there were two of those guys in Dallas. We went with Dr. David Barnett at Baylor, and, and who cares, because I'm not having surgery anyway. They're going to give me meds, and, and we're going to watch it. And so we walk into Dr. Barnett's office Tuesday, so I had, the sur- or I had the seizure Thursday. Tuesday, walk in, and we sit across from Barnett, and he flips on his little screen, and he said, hey, this looks bad. I've scheduled a resection for you on Friday. Uh, and so we're going to go in on Friday, and we're going we're to take that out. And then he, he said, so right frontal lobe is is it's, if you're going to have a brain tumor, it's where you want it, which, oh, thanks. Uh, um, it, it is, it's where spatial reasoning is done. So now listen to this. Spatial reasoning is where you take an idea or a concept, you, you look at it from different angles, you, you create it in an organized way, and then you, you, you file it away. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the only skill I possess. <laughs> like that's all, literally the only thing I can do is what you just described. My job is doing what you just described. I, I look at the Bible, I read theologians, I kind of look at it from all these different angles, I ask the Holy Spirit to help me and do the work of illumination, and, and then I build out a sermon and preach it. Like you have just described my livelihood and, and all my degrees are in spatial reasoning, uh, which means, can, we, can you take out the occipital lobe or something? Is there another place you can go in at that. And, and so uh, walked out the room. It was really discombobulating. Um, and, and so we, we kind of stepped out and I had to make calls. I mean, I had to call um, Brian Miller here. I mean, I don't, I don't know when I'm coming back to preach. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how this is going. I don't know who I'm going to be when I wake up. Here are all the list of dangers. Of course, I am just crazy concerned about my kids already crazy concerned because you don't want to have a grand mal seizure in front of your children. You just don't want to do that. Um, and so, so in line of all that, we, we go in and we, we do the craniotomy on that Friday. It's a eight, close to nine hour surgery. They were super aggressive in the surgery, multiple interoperative MRIs done in uh, the surgery just to try to be as aggressive as possible. But, but just um, a couple of days before I went into surgery, we shot a video for the church that was actually played this weekend because I didn't know if I'd ever be back. And then I, know, I didn't know if I did come back, what I would be like when I did come back. And so I wanted to shoot uh, a video uh, just to kind of press us on. And, and really, it, it, watching the video, I didn't watch it again until this morning in the 8.30, which was foolish. Um, but, but the, the le- like, it was easier to say these things before the surgery than it was to live them out after the surgery. So I just want to say that before we watch the video. But this is the video we showed 10 years ago today. Uh, I had already gone through the surgery, um, but we showed it that weekend after. Um, hi, I'm Matt Chandler. I'm the lead pastor, teaching pastor here at the Village Church. Um, if you haven't heard, it's been uh, quite the weekend, uh, really quite the week for us. Uh, on Thanksgiving morning, uh, I had a seizure and woke up in the hospital. Uh, they did some scans and they found a, a tumor on my right frontal lobe. Um, it's about uh, two inches um, by one inch, so two inches in diameter, about one inch deep. Um, and on Friday, really by the time you watch this, uh, they're going to go in and, and cut it out. And so I, I wanted to say just a couple of things to you uh, very quickly. Um, knowing that this is the first weekend in FMX, we're live streaming, like all these good things are happening, I'm having to miss out on that. Uh, just trust the Lord with that. Um, but in, in the end, a couple of things. One, I, I just can't thank you enough. Um, and really the places where our hearts have been real tender is 
um, just the outpouring of love and encouragement and support and prayers um, from really not just the village, but all over the world. And um, that's been such a humbling, humbling thing uh, to me and my family. Um, and so I wanted to thank you for that. And then um, the second thing, I just wanted to say this um, so you could hear me say this. Um, I've been, in my travels this fall, I've been preaching kind of the same message out of Hebrews 11. And in Hebrews 11, um, he says that, that some shut the mouths of lions and, and some, um, they put foreign armies to flight. And some, he, you know, he kind of goes through this, all these good things that happen to these men of God. And then right in the middle of, I believe, um, I believe it's verse 30. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's somewhere right in there. All of a sudden just turns. I think it's 32. It just turns. And all of a sudden it says, and some were tortured. And, and some um, were sawn in two, and some were destitute, and some were, and, and then he said, but both, both walked in faith. And, and so this, I'm 35 years old, I'm at this point in my life, all he's ever given me um, was, I mean, we just, we've shut the mouths of lions, and we've put foreign armaments to flight, and we fought against injustice, and there've been nothing but good um, that has come. And so I've always felt like, um, I've always felt what, when I taught that message, there was this hitch in me that was going, when I say, but some don't get that, I, I thought that there would be people in the crowd that would say, um, well, well, of course you're going to say that. Of course you're going to point that out because God's done nothing but be good to you. He's done nothing but be gracious. He's done nothing but let you have victory after victory after victory. Um, and so when this all came out and then when we found out from the surgeon that there, we were expecting to get multiple options, here are your options, and we didn't. We got, there's one option. We need to get in there now. Um, I, there's this part of me that's so grateful that the Lord counted me worthy for this. And there's this part of me that goes, okay, because now in an area where it's not a big win, I get to show that he's enough and I get to praise him and exalt him and, and make much of him in this because I've got to make much of him in this. Now he, he's counted me worthy to, to point to him in this. Um, and so know that, man, we, we've cried our tears at my house and, man, I've held my children and I've kissed them and I've kissed my wife. And what I, what I would love is to be a 70-year-old man drinking coffee. I would love to walk my daughter down the aisle. I would love to see um, my boy turn into the athlete I never was. I mean, I would love to, I would love to do all of that. Um, but none of those things is better than him. None of those things. And I'm saying that now. I'm saying that right now, not as the guy who has everything and has nothing in front of him that he could lose, but I'm telling you that now as a guy who could lose everything in, in an instant. Um, and so, man, I love you. I love this place. It's been the great joy of my life to yell at you for seven years. Um, my plan is to come back um, more aggressive. That's my plan. And so we'll see what the Lord has for me. Um, I, am, I am not afraid. Uh, and so for those of you who kind of you just keep living in fear, um, and, and you would try to use this as an excuse to continue in that fear. Don't you dare use me as an excuse to continue in your lies. Um, my hope would be that you would see that he is good in all things, and that he would never send to any of us things he does not provide strength for. I love you more than you know. I can't wait to, can't wait to be back. can't wait to be back. I love you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I would like to reiterate... Um, it was easier to say that before I woke up from the surgery. It was easier to say that going into surgery than it was to live out on the other side. So I uh, woke up from surgery, had some residual effects. One of those was a flat effect, which means I could not show any emotion with my face, neither sadness nor joy, which really freaked everyone out who knows me because I'm so naturally expressive and I couldn't show it. So I would make a joke, but I would be deadpan as I would make it, or I would be really excited to see you, or I wouldn't even know that you walked into the room. Um, and, and so I could acknowledge that some people walked in, but I didn't even notice other people walked in and it wasn't tied to my affection. So it was just a really weird time. Some of my spatial reasoning was affected. Like one of the, the deals that I had to do in inpatient rehab is they said, uh, okay, which one of these doesn't belong? A knife, a fork, or a chainsaw? And my mind went, they all three cut. They all belong. So sweet Lauren was like, no, Matt, we're sitting at dinner. There's a knife and a fork and a chainsaw. And my mind was like, what do we have in then? I mean, what do we need? The chainsaw's there to... So, I mean, literally, I couldn't... And so, inpatient rehab, 
um, after I, I woke up where they were trying to stress out other parts of my brain to get them to come over and help the part that they had just removed. And no one was telling me what they found. No one had said to me, this is what you've got, or this is what you found, or like, like no one, and I'm not even sure I knew how to ask. And when I would ask, no one would tell me. They, I was easily distracted in those days. And so um, finally, uh, Dr. Barnett said about a, a week or so later, maybe eight or nine days later, he, he, he asked me to come into his office, Lauren and I to come into his office and, and kind of first red flag besides the surgery itself was, um, why, don't you, why don't you bring some people, why don't you bring some family members, why don't you bring some, which, which like at that point, you know, okay, they're not having me bring family members to go, you're awesome, right? That's not, if they're like, bring support, uh, it's probably not good news, right? I mean, that, that's just kind of, even with three quarters of a brain, I knew that, that what I'm about to hear is probably not good news. Um, and so we sat down in Barnett's office. And he's got this little piece of paper and he said, okay, we, we took seven swatches of your tumor uh, and you have what's called anaplastic oligodendroglioma who grade three. You have an incurable form of brain cancer. Um, the, the prognosis on that actually wouldn't tell me the prognosis early on. I had to find out later that it would be two to three years. Um, and, and I'm just telling you for everything I know, the floor dropped out because what happens when someone tells you that you have that long to live is you do, just do math. You, you just do math in your head. And I didn't do my math. I did Audrey's math and I did Reed's math and I did Nora's math. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, really? And I'm just telling you, the floor dropped out on me. And I'm grasping for verses, and I'm just trying to figure out, how do I stop from falling? How do I, it was just so disorienting, despite all the verses I knew, despite how hard I had preached to us on how to make sense of suffering. See, part of the arrogance that was in me, and I didn't even know it was in me, and we'll get to this here in a moment, as I was trying to get us ready and never thought it had anything to do with me. I'm like, let me teach you to suffer well. And the Lord's like, that's so cute. I'm getting you ready, dum dum. <laughs> and so finally got to go home. Um, and I don't know if you remember Christmas that year. It snowed like we lived in Minneapolis. Uh, I mean, it just dumped on us. And my first foray out of my home was to Christmas Eve service. And I sat in the back and was anxious that I was ruining it for everyone because I was ugly sobbing the entire time because I'm just wondering, is this my last Christmas? Do I only get one more of these? And yet, man, those songs of the incarnation, man, they, they make a lot of sense when you're staring into the precipice. And um, man, went home and, and again, it was just such a disorienting time. I couldn't, like everywhere I looked, I just saw loss. I don't know how to explain it. Like I couldn't, um, to look at Audrey killed me. It just killed me. Um, I just remember she would sit up in this little stairwell in our house on Catlin Circle and she'd look down, she's supposed to be in bed, but she'd always sit up there and be shady and, um, <laughs> and I meant to see her. I, I felt like I had to, I just couldn't take it. I just had to withdraw. Now part of that was I was hopped up on Decadron um, and, and I don't get angry on Decadron. I weep like a baby about everything. Like literally to watch, and here's what was someone like, I couldn't watch, if I watched TV and the wrong commercial could come on, I'd have a breakdown, like a sobbing breakdown. And, and so like for my family to see that, that that's like that, that's not how I normally operate, right? Uh, I don't see uh, like, a, like a Hallmark commercial for a coming and breakdown weeping. Uh, and yet that's where I was in that season. And I just kept waiting, kept waiting to kind of land on solid ground again. And, and over time, uh, I would, but it just took a bit. It was super disoriented. And so I, I, I had to start um, not long after the surgery, six weeks of radiation five days a week and low dose chemotherapy. And here's like, I was 35 and in great shape and man, my body could take a beating. And, and so we blew through radiation and low dose chemo to where I was like, man, this is not what it, they make it look like in cancer movies, which I don't ever recommend watching. Right. And, um, and, and so I, I thought, man, we'll just blow right through this. I'll probably even be able to preach through this. Um, in fact, the, my uh, radiation oncologist said to me, um, uh, the last week of radiation, man, you have some strong hair follicles. 
And I was like, thanks, man. And then uh, I put my head on my pillow for a nap the next day. And when I lifted up my head, all this hair just stayed right on the pillow. And, and so then I've got to shave my head and somehow make that fun for the kids who are very little. And, and right, you're, you're just trying to navigate these spaces that, that aren't common and there's no playbook on how to navigate it. Um, and, and so uh, after, after this, I take my, I get a month off. Uh, we celebrate Lauren's 30th birthday. Uh, we fly to New York, and I took her to see Muse at Madison Square Garden. Don't, don't email me on that, all right? And, and so we went up and played in New York City and watched Muse at Madison Square Garden. If you don't know who Muse is, don't, don't worry about it. And uh, we did that and just had a good time. And God bless her. She was going to all these kind of whole food places and eating with me clean because I have to eat clean now. Uh, and, and then we come back, and I take my first high-dose round of chemotherapy, and it blows me up. And, and I fall into a bit of a depression, which is a result of the meds, and I had no idea to expect that. I am not naturally melancholy. Uh, I, I, am not, I do not default to sadness very easily at all. And there was some about those meds that were messing me up. Like that first round, I was wondering if I was a Christian. And so we called um, Karen Fink, uh, my neuro-oncologist, and, and Karen would always call chemo she uh, and so don't, don't at me on this one either, right? She, uh, Karen would say to me, if you push her, she will push you back because I'm, I'm like, a, I'm going to drive, right? I'm going to push through. If I'm not feeling well, let's, let's push through. Let's just get it done. Let's get done the things that we have to get done. And Karen was like, if you win the day, she'll take your week. So if you feel tired, you need to lay down and take a nap. You need to, don't fight her. Let her do her work. Right? So I'm not a sexist. Karen called it a her. And so chemo is a wicked, evil woman. Uh, and, and so now let me tell you why I'm kind of highlighting this for you. Uh, a couple of reasons. Let me give you a couple of texts, and it'll kind of get you at what I'm after today. Ecclesiastes 7.2 says this. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. And then Moses in Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Now, now I have rarely kind of shared my journey in this in this season, uh, other than the, than the book TBC just wrote, like, I don't know if you know, I don't own that. That's our stories. The village owns joy in sorrows. That's the story of our brothers and sisters in this family of faith talking about seasons of difficulty. And I put my story in there, but I don't know that I've ever done this, which is publicly just share some of the things that the Spirit of God taught me in that season. And so I've got two things, uh, and I need to be quick about it. Here's the, the first thing that I learned in this 18 months of high dose chemotherapy and wrestling um, with, um, a, at least for me, the most immense suffering that, that I had endured uh, to that point in my life and probably since that point. He, here's number one although God did not give me cancer, He worked powerfully in my suffering. Right? Although God did not give me cancer, he worked powerfully in my suffering. Although I am a happy Calvinist, not an angry one, a happy Calvinist, I am not a determinalist. I do not believe that God gave me cancer. I think suffering and, and brokenness in this world come from three places. One, the whole universe was fractured when sin entered the cosmos. That means my DNA is broken. That means my genetic line is broken. That, that means Everything was fractured in the fall. It was created as beautiful, and now it is broken in the fall. Sometimes suffering happens because the world's broken. Sometimes suffering happens because men and women are sinful. We are sinful, and we choose paths that have consequences. And sometimes other people's sin creates suffering in our lives, right? And so we know that suffering and hurt and pain and disease come because the world is fractured, come between uh, because we've made poor decisions or other people have sinned against us, or lastly, because of some kind of demonic activity. And that one gets very little press, but is a very real place in which physical suffering comes. Right? Now, with, with that said, which one was going on in me? Look right at me. This is important. No idea. No idea. But here's what I do know that God was doing a surgery on my spirit that matched 
what was going on in me physically. That where surgeons were cutting out from me that which would kill me, God was removing from me that which would kill me. And that while doctors were poisoning me in the hopes that fast-growing cells would die and that cells that were hell-bent on destroying me would vanish, so the Spirit of God was putting to death toxic, insidious spiritual cells that were meant to pervert and to break and ultimately to destroy me. Let me highlight a couple of those. Here, here would be um, the, the first one. I'll, I'll just do two for time's sake. Um, so it, it's Christmas time. I'm not allowed to be left alone. Uh, I'm not allowed to drive. I'm not, if you know my personality, that, that's just my own personal hell, all right? I, I need a little me time and I need some freedom. All right, and I got none of those. Like somebody's always there in case I have a seizure. I'm not allowed to drive myself anywhere. And so I spend a lot of time just sitting on the couch, which I am not built for. And, and so I'm sitting on the couch and, and, and this is like, like everybody starts sending you Christmas cards now. Like everybody gets Christmas cards with pictures of their families on it or, or in cases that I still don't understand, just pictures of their dogs. Like here, I love your dog. I'm not dogging it. I'm just like, do we know these people? I'm not sure, it's just their labradoodles. And so put your labradoodles on there, just include yourself on the picture. I know this is way too late, it's already in December, you've already had these pics taken. Take another one, anyway, I, no, no time for this. So I've got all of these cards around our mantle. Lauren just kind of has strung them all over our mantle. I'm sitting on the couch and I see on the mantle um, this picture of a family where the man is a serial adulterer and is really verbally abusive to his daughters. And, and I knew this because I'm the pastor of this church. And I just remember sitting there thinking, really, God? Me? He, like, like this guy right now. This guy's got a long future ahead of him. He's got, and it, man, I've read dudes do this in the Bible. I'm like, oh, idiot. And now it's my turn, and I'm, with Jeremiah, I'm with the, and I'm sitting on my couch, and I'm like, me? Like, this guy gets the pass? And, I'm, and I mean, in an instant, the Holy Spirit brought Luke 15 up to me and said, you're the older brother right now. What do you know about what I'm doing? What is, you should just rejoice that I might do a work in his life. Well, why now have you paired you against him? You're both sinners. Are you better than him? Is not my work in you my work in you? Do you think you're the one that has established this thing in your heart, or am I the one that established this in your heart? Uh, and man, like, praise God, because I, I did not know that was in me. I didn't know it was in me. In fact, if you would have pressed me, I would have said, not a chance. I'm praying and fasting for those brothers. I know that every good gift that I've been given has been given by God. No, I had an insidious, wicked heart, and it was deep, and I couldn't get to it. I couldn't see it. And so he, here's the other thing that really stood out to me. This isn't number two. This is for free. Um, <laughs> one of the things I learned is, let, let's just say, and I don't know, let's just say that what was happening to me was demonic. Let's say there was some kind of plan hatched in the heavenlies to kind of take me out or wound me or, or get me out of the way. Like I've, it's always blown my mind that, that what the enemy may, meant for my destruction actually turned into a tool that served God. And so I'm always just marveling at just how mighty is God that the work of his enemy actually serves his purposes. I mean, that's stunning, right? Uh, and, and so, man, I, I saw that happen in me and was able to repent. And then the other thing um, that, that happened in this kind of spiritual surgery, the things he's removing, um, was, man, I, I could swing from, I could swing from, God's going to heal me, everything's going to be amazing, to, oh my gosh, I'm going to die and some other man's going to pursue my wife, like that. I mean, it could happen, in the, and the worst time of the day for me was, anyone want to guess? Nighttime. It, it is, when you are sick like this, terminal, it is an incredibly lonely place. Now, if Lauren uh, were up here, she would probably talk about how lonely it was for her to experience that. Uh, but, but when it's you, like I, I know my bride loves me. I was surrounded by great friends who loved and served us and came alongside of us and spoke words of life into us. But it's still just me and the Lord laying in my bed at night. 
And, and I learned in that season that, that anxiety sometimes isn't a war you get to win. It's just a battle you get to fight. Well, like I never had this kind of um, concise victory over anxiety through the whole thing. Gosh, even now I can get a little anxious going into an MRI. Like I, I don't have the kind of cancer to like, it's been 10 years, don't worry about it. Now, I, I just say Jesus has healed me and I ain't worried about it. But, but every once in a while, right, I can just get this, oh, I hope, you know, we don't do that again. So grateful for what you did, but I'd rather not hop back on that bull. Uh, will you train me another way? Teach me another way, right? Uh, and so um, in, in this season, he, here's what, uh, I'm laying in bed at night and I'm thinking, oh, okay, chances are, I mean, the math says I'm not gonna be around. I'm gonna have to stand in front of God I'm going to have to give an account for my life. And then immediately, when you, like, like when you lean over that precipice, right? And you're like, okay, face to face. I, I couldn't help but wonder if I had, I certainly wasn't where I wanted to be in Christ. Anyone else would say that about you right now? I, I want to be further along. I want to be more in love. I want to walk more in his presence and power. I want, that's exactly where I was. And I was thinking, okay, I, I haven't had a chance to get there. I haven't had a chance to get victory over this or, or to kind of nail this flat. And oh gosh, I haven't dealt with this. And I so want to get here. And it would just haunt me. It would just haunt me. And then yet again, in the Lord's kindness, it was the same reminder as what he reminded me on my pride, which was, is it not by grace alone? Do you, is it not true that all you bring is faith in my grace? Because if, if that's the case, Matt, what, what are you trying to get to? Brother, you're there. Son, you're there. You're not trying to get there. You're there. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your own doing, but of my doing. You're already there. You don't get there. You are there. You are mine. I indwell you by my spirit. You don't have to earn my love. It has been bestowed upon you before the foundation of the earth was laid. And so I just learned, oh man, if it's not grace, then we're all doomed. If it's not grace, we're all doomed. Now, I want you to hear me say this. That was kind of what he removed from me, and here's what he brought to me. There is a thickness of the presence of God made available in the dark night of the soul. There is a tangible, and, and if, I could, if I could want anything for you, it would be that you would experience the love of God in Christ in, in a way that transcends just knowledge. Are you tracking with me? Like that you would get a deep sense that he loves you, that he's present. And I'm t- I experience, like on my bathroom floor, I would have these intense just this intense awareness of his presence, of his love for me, of his, like I'm telling you, I sometimes, I miss that. Like I feel physically strong, I feel mentally sharp, I feel right, like, and, and I miss, this is so crazy, like I miss feeling weak and like I could die at any second. Because there was just this thing of his nearness in that place that, I, that, that you can't replicate outside of that place, although it's always true about all of us. Like, the great theologian Sting sang a great song about this, right? How fragile we are, right? Like, you are just so fragile. You say this all the time. There isn't anyone in this room whose whole life couldn't change by your phone ringing in your pocket right now. Right now. There isn't any amount of spinach and blueberries, no amount of Pilates, no amount of living clean that could stop that phone from ringing. You're not God. I'm not God. We don't control the universe like that. We, we just don't. And so to feel and sense the manifest presence of God in my life, sometimes supernaturally like that, but, but other times just made visible in the saints. God, we were so well cared for, so well loved. People came alongside of us. Uh, like, and, and sometimes it's overwhelming. Like I, I think I have every cancer book written in the 10 years previous to my cancer to the ones that came out. And, and everybody had a story about how uh, their aunt drank nothing but flaxseed and, and put oils on the bottom of her feet and, and, and she, she, you know, it cured an incurable cancer. And so you had to navigate all of that. And everybody was well-meaning and loving and come alongside. And I think we still have leftovers from a decade ago from the amount of meals that came to our house. Now, look right at me. I want you to hear me say this. Everyone suffers. Look at me. Everyone suffers. God redeems our suffering as his children. 
He does not waste our sorrows ever. He does not waste our sorrows ever. Okay, that's the first thing I learned. Second thing, I've got to move quickly. I, I came out of this all the more wanting my life to matter. Now, I, I'm not talking about Dead Poet Society Carpe Diem, although it's a great movie. Right? And I, I guarantee you somebody in here has got that tattoo, Carpe Diem. Right, seize the day. It's great. It is a great movie. Uh, I, I kind of mean that, but I mean more than that. Let me, let me kind of highlight what I mean when I talk about wanting my life to matter. Philippians 3, 12 through 16 says this. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I love that. Not what you will attain, what you have attained. So let me talk about briefly what I mean when I say I want my life to matter. Now, now here's the first thing right out of the gate. You got to get this. And this is kind of, if I've got one note, I'm pressing for the rest of my life. It's God's love for you and Jesus. Did you see what happened in this passage? Because it's super important. He says, I'm taking hold of that which has already taken hold of me, that Christ took hold of me, that the triune God of the universe before the foundation of the earth was laid, grabbed hold of Matt Chandler and said, this is my guy. I love this guy. I love him in all his brokenness, all his foolishness, all his pride, all his air. I love him. I'm crazy about him. I rejoice over him. You insert your name there if you're a Christian. You haven't taken hold of Christ. He's taken hold of you. That's why he's saying only let us live up to what we've already attained. It's already yours. Life in Christ, if you're a Christian, it's already yours. He has taken hold of me. And that, that's, that's base level Christianity. It's not you're going to try harder, you're going to do more. It's that Christ has taken hold of you. That's why we worship and make much of Jesus. We don't worship and make much of ourselves. That Christ has taken hold of of me. And then he says this, and this is super important, forgetting what lies behind. So now that Christ has taken hold of me, I can forget what lies behind. I've got to move quickly. How many of you, um, just, just in, in, a, in a moment of honesty and transparency, would say, man, I, I've got some screw-ups behind me that really haunt me. Man, I've blown it in ways that, golly, they just haunt me. And, and so here, here's what happens. Here's why it's so important for you to know that, that God knows that and Christ still took hold of you. Because what happens in the present, this is one of the, 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 the enemy's favorite tactics, is in your present reality, keep you from your destiny by reminding you of your screw-ups in the past, and he'll just whisper you, you're going to do it again. You're going to blow it again. You're going to drink again. You're going to cheat again. You're going to run again. You're going to blow it again, because that's what you do. And all, and all of a sudden, you, your brain will remember these voices that have come alongside that voice. You'll remember a coach, or you'll remember this moment with your dad, or you'll remember this teacher, or you'll remember this moment with your friends where you're just not enough, and you're not going to measure up, and you're not beautiful enough, and you're not strong enough, you're not masculine enough, you're not feminine enough, you're not, and that lie is going to whisper in your ear, and Paul's saying, you, you want your life to matter? You remember Christ has taken, so Christ is crazy about you. He delights in you. He rejoices over you, and I'm telling you, this is what I most desperately want you to get in your bones. Because if you get that, then I can forget what's behind. Doesn't matter what your daddy said about you. Doesn't, doesn't matter what the coach said. Doesn't matter what that. Doesn't matter what that lie says. Doesn't matter how often you've blown it. So I'm constantly highlighting for you that nobody in the Bible could work at the village church. Maybe Jesus and Daniel. That's all we got. And Daniel would. I mean, people would be skeptical about our brother Daniel. Look, I had a dream about you. You're like, well, I don't know about all that, right? He, I mean, this is this weird kind of this. This is. Yeah, like the people in the, the Bible is not a book of spotless heroes. It is train wreck families and, and broken, deplorable people who Christ has saved and ransomed and said they're mine. So we get to forget what's behind. And then I love this, strive for what lies ahead. What lies ahead? What lies ahead for you and I in Christ 
is ever-increasing joy for all of eternity that doesn't start once we shed this physical body, but it starts right now for those of us who are in Christ. Like ever-increasing joy. He is an inexhaustible. That's, that's what lies. So we're striving for what lies ahead. We're straining for what lies ahead. So, so I've oftentimes said, uh, like, there, and, and having experienced what I've experienced, I, I can say with some authority that, that there is nothing we are enduring now that will seem overwhelming 10,000 years from now. 10,000 years from now, all our lowest moments here, our lowest moments here will seem like small things. That does not mean that they are small things now. I'm saying that 10,000 years from now, they'll look small to us because right now they look like Mount Everest on top of Mount Everest. Right? Okay. So Christ has taken hold of me. Forget what is behind, stri- straining for what lies ahead. And then I love this, for the upward call of God in Christ. So I talk a lot about navel gazing here, uh, and here's what I mean by that. Um, we've been talking in our fall series, or we talked in our fall series uh, about the difference between redemptive lens and moral lens. And if you're a man or woman that's constantly looking at your own navel and oh, I don't measure up, and I don't, oh gosh, I'm screwed up again. I can't believe I did that. I wish I wasn't this. I wish I was more of this. I wish I was less of this. I wish. I... And, and you don't lift your. See, this is the upward call of God in Christ, which means you're stuck if you keep staring at your navel. Look at me. You are weak. You are probably going to blow it again. You are going to ruin something. You are going to break something. You don't know that God knew that before Christ went to the cross? You really think that, that God's looking at you now and is like, oh gosh, this guy caused a brutal divorce. I can't use him anymore. That's nonsensical, demonic propaganda. He sees you. He loves you. He's crazy. Like the upward call of God in Christ. Get your eyes up. Walk in the presence of God into your destiny. So, so how, how should we end today? Well, two things. Um, the first is, I know that many of you right now, like for a lot of people, this message is for your future. It's not for today. Like there's a lot of young faces in the room and you're like, well, you know, things have gone pretty well. I hate that that happened to you, pastor, but man, I, because that's what 34-year-old Matt would have said. Right? Like, what are you talking about? I mean, I, I mean, I know it comes. I can see it in the Bible, but, right? So, so for some of you, this will just need to be filed, and by the grace of God, the Spirit will kick it up and remind you of some things in time. Nobody gets out without bleeding, I don't think. But for some of you, this is current reality. This, is, this season's going to be hard. There's been loss. There's been news that has come. There's been things that have come to light recently that are deeply painful. And, and so we want to pray for you. We wanna, I want to invite you up and, and, and have you be prayed for. We, we want to lay our hands on you and just say, we're with you. We, we, we understand the, the Bible doesn't paint this picture that we don't suffer, that we don't suffer loss, that we don't get perplexed, that we don't. And so I just want to say, like, like we see you, we, we're with you in this season where all the lights and all the cheers are going to be ratcheted up, that, that sometimes it's just a difficult, hard, lonely, discombobulating season. And, and you being here this morning and me feeling impressed in August to make this weekend this is part of God's big plan to go, hey, listen, I see you. I haven't forgotten you. This isn't my wrath on you. I'm not punishing you. And then secondly, if you are struggling with some resentment and bitterness because of something that occurred a while back or maybe recently and God did not answer your prayers like you wanted him to and God behaved in such a way in a sovereign reign that was confusing to you and, and you can't see any good in what happened. Because I'm telling you, as a pastor, I've just done some funerals that I can't make sense of. I've done some funerals that I'm like, I cannot see the glory of God in that. And, and then a decade later, 12 years later, I, I still don't know what the Lord accomplished in that. And part of that is because I'm finite and he is not. So, so I, two things have helped me. 
Um, the first is, uh, Augustine is my ancient friend. And what I mean by that is to stay not swayed in the day in which I live. Uh, I've rooted myself in Augustine, uh, who is far from a perfect man, but, but man, he was saved out of some ratchet stuff, and so I love him. And, and he's just super gracious to, to broken people. And um, he, he would say that to live life in this world is to have your face pressed up against a stained glass window so that all you can see is chipped glass and some color, but you have no idea of the beauty of the stained glass window. God sees the stained glass window and he is placing the different broken pieces where that, that one day those who are in Christ will see the picture and rejoice all the more in him. And, and so that's always helped me. Hey, that's broken glass. It's broken glass and it's fitting into a stained glass window in a way that I just can't see. So it's a, it's a confession of my limited view of things. And then the other one, and this is more modern, um, I loved this, it, it, it hurt the first time I read it, but Tim Keller says this, God always answers your prayers in precisely the way you want them to be answered if you knew everything he knew. I mean, I just felt like a low blow the first time I read it, right? It's like, hey, if you knew what God knew, you would answered your prayers the same way, but you don't know what God knows, so you'd probably need to walk in some humility. And, and so here's, man, if you're, Man, if you've just got bitterness and resentment and, and you've experienced loss, they would confound, if not cripple, many of us. And you have found in yourself a root of bitterness. I want to yet again invite you to come up and, and be prayed for, to be encouraged, to lean into being able to trust God. We look to the cross and we know he's good. We look to the fact that he has always moved towards us and not from us as a testimony of his grace. We are not under wrath. We are under mercy. And maybe today the Lord wants to free you from the weight of being angry at him. He can hold up under your anger towards him. It is you that is being robbed of joy in him. Like we can look through the Bible and watch Jeremiah say, you tricked me, or, uh, or David go, how long will you forsake me forever? I mean, you can see people holler at God like, like maybe you are in your spirit right now, but, but it's not God that is lessened. It is not God that is diminished by the accusation. And, and it's okay for you to make the accusation. I just want to give you the invitation to step out from under the weight of it and trust that although we do not understand, he is good and the evidence of his goodness is expansive. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters, for your grace on our lives, for your mercy. Father, for my brothers and sisters in seasons of immense suffering, God, I just pray presence for them today, awareness of your goodness and grace today, a reminder of your mercy today. For my brothers and sisters who this season is gonna be incredibly difficult because of loss, new loss or loss from years ago that haunts, I just pray that you bring peace, that you allow them that Psalm 51 broken and contrite in spirit confession where they let it all out and find your response to that being compassion. I thank you that you know it's scary to be us, you know it's confusing to be us, and you meet it with empathy and not condemnation. We sing now praises to you regardless of what time of day it is, regardless of what season it is, regardless of what hour it is, we praise you. And it's for your beautiful name, amen.